Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Carolyn Wester. I'm the director of the Division of Viral Hepatitis um, at the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and absolutely delighted to have the opportunity to welcome you to today's, um, the first day of a two-day convening addressing unlocking hepatitis C in key, key settings. Um, the vision for this two-day convening, which was um, began to be conceptualized several months ago, is really to bring together subject matter expertise, uh, subject matter experts to identify effective strategies for diagnosing and delivering hepatitis C in key settings that care for populations with disproportionately higher rates of hepatitis C. Our subject matter experts will include representatives not only from CDC and other federal government agencies, as well as academia, national and community-based organizations, clinicians, and public health partners with hepatitis C subject matter expertise. The expected product from this consultation, in addition to robust discussion during the meeting, will be a report that identifies and summarizes key strategies when, with supported with a, um, technical assistance, can be scaled broadly in support of national viral hepatitis elimination goals. Of course, moving something from concept into actuality takes months of planning and hard work. And I wanna thank um, not only my colleagues at the Division of Viral Hepatitis with a specific, specific shout out to Nate Furukawa, our senior um, advisor on hep C elimination, as well as um, individuals in our policy and comms teams, Karina Rapicelli, Ijioma Hiasoto, and also Carrie Sapsis, but absolutely as well, our colleagues from NASDAD and NVHR, who you'll be hearing from shortly, who took concept into reality and have my tremendous thanks um, and uh, respect certainly far beyond this convening as well. I will turn this over now to Daniel Raymond, who is the Director of Policy at the National Viral Hepatitis Roundtable. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, thank you especially for the kind words, but also for your and your colleagues at CDC's unflagging support for this project and for your vision and leadership. Um, as Carolyn said, I'm Dana Raymond with the National Viral Hepatitis Roundtable. Uh, we have been so excited to partner with NASDAD and um, bring this to fruition. So. I wanted to just lay out what you can expect over the next couple of days. Uh, so this is a project that we uh, launched under the umbrella of HEPNET, the Hepatitis Network for Education and Testing, which is a CC-supported uh, initiative with NASDAQ, MVHR, and NATO, focused on improving and increasing strategies to engage people who use drugs in viral hepatitis, outreach education, testing, and linkage to care. And as an outgrowth of that project, we really wanted to step back and assess where we were as a field by convening hepatitis C subject matter experts to identify effective strategies to increase nationwide hepatitis C testing and treatment in key settings. You'll hear a little bit more in a moment about why these key settings and their relevance, but our overall hope is to foster inclusive and transparent engagement between sectors engaged in hepatitis C elimination activities. And so to the, that end, we are going to look at how we can overcome barriers to providing hepatitis C testing and treatment in these settings, uh, optimal or promising models of care in each setting, and the kinds of partners, platforms, and strategies that can scale up integration of hepatitis C testing and treatment in these various settings uh, with an end goal, as Dr. Wester noted, of a meeting summary that identifies the lessons learned, the best practices, and promising approaches that we can all use effectively. Next slide, please. So I'm going to give you a very quick overview of our agenda. So starting today, and these are all times listed here as Eastern time, uh, welcome to the welcome. Uh, we will immediately follow this up uh, by some uh, overview from Nate Perkar from the CDC to set the stage. 
And then we'll move into the bulk of this virtual convening, uh, starting with one of our key settings, uh, treatment facilities and programs that provide medication for opioid use disorder, uh, sometimes referred to as MAT. Um, and we'll have a great roster of panelists and ample time for discussion and, and question and answer. We'll take a brief break after that, and then we will move into a similar panel, this time focused on state correctional facilities. Uh, again, we have some great speakers lined up from different jurisdictions, and we are planning on leaving ample time for Q&A and discussion. Um, and that will be the first day. Next slide. And then tomorrow we'll reconvene at the same time uh, and move into panels for our other two key settings that we're focusing on. The first being federally qualified health centers, and then the second being the certain services programs. And then we'll wrap up the entire event with a general discussion and synthesis, pulling out some of the key themes, cross-cutting issues, and outlining uh, what our next steps are for this project. And with that, I will turn it over to Jasmine West from NASDAQ. Thanks for that, Daniel. Hi, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon. Jasmine West, she, her pronouns. I'm a manager on NASA's hepatitis team. Next slide, please. So just a bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, all participants are in listen and view only mode. So we'll hear from our moderators, our panelists today. If you do have questions during sessions, feel free to submit those through the Q&A box that you'll see at the bottom of your Zoom screen. This whole event is being recorded and will be made available to attendees. So whether you join one session today or the entire event, um, it will be made available hereafter. And then as Daniel mentioned, um, we are going to synthesize the content of this convening into a report that is going to be disseminated. Um, it's going to highlight the key strategies that will most effectively increase hepatitis C and treatment in these uh, key settings that were outlined in the agenda. Uh, lastly here, there will be an evaluation link made available to attendees. So again, if you join you know, one session today or tomorrow, please fill it out. Um, let us know how this information is relevant to your work. Next slide, please. And before we dive into presentations, we do just want to take a moment to acknowledge the folks who have put in a lot of time planning, preparing for this event between NASTAD, NVHR, and CDC. We're, we're grateful for the support that's made this convening possible. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nate Furukawa to set the stage. We have hepatitis C testing and treatment in high impact settings. All you, Nate. Thanks, Jasmine. So um, hi, everyone. I'm Nate Furukawa, Senior Advisor for Hep C Elimination and Division of Viral Hepatitis at CDC. So excited to be here with you all and just uh, see that we have a, a, a very healthy, nice um, participant number and uh, eager to see it creeping up even as I'm talking. Um, so I'm here to set the stage for what will be, I hope, a very informative um, next couple of days. Um, so let's get started. So we know that hepatitis C is a virus that thrives at the margins of society. It, oh, go back, please. So it flourishes among those who are socially marginalized by structural factors such as poverty, racism, addiction, and trauma. And it exists as a piece of a larger syndemic alongside HIV, STIs, substance use, and overdose. And this makes our task of attaining elimination all that more difficult. So direct acting antivirals, which are highly effective in cost savings have been around for nearly a decade, but despite this, they aren't reaching the people who need them the most. So we at CDC recognize that elimination is only possible by focusing on the most marginalized and difficult to reach populations, bringing them into care, not just for hep C, but for other syndemic conditions that interact with each other and the social determinants of health. So we're deeply invested in scaling up hep C treatment by making it available and accessible in the places where people most at risk receive care. And this includes the focus of today's and tomorrow's panels, programs that offer medications for opiate use disorder, state departments of corrections, community health centers, and syringe service programs. So in this stage setting introductory presentation, I'll review our progress in hep C elimination, and then make the case for why we have to focus on scaling up testing and treatment in these four impact settings. Next slide. So first we're gonna get on the same page about our progress to date on hepatitis C elimination. Next slide. 
So let's start with some good news. One of our national goals for hepatitis C elimination is to reduce HCV-related deaths by 65% by 2030. The green bars in this graph show the age-adjusted rate of hepatitis C-related deaths by year, with the most recent data being 2021. The dotted line shows our annual targets, and as you can see, we are currently meeting our targets. Advances in hepatitis C treatment have surely helped bring this down. But before we celebrate, let's not forget the generational differences in hepatitis C. A lot of the baby boomers who got hepatitis C in the 70s and 80s and who are not cured may have progressed to cirrhosis and may have in fact already died. And therefore some of this decline may be in part due to a fewer numbers of infections that we observed in the subsequent generation X. Next slide. I think this next slide injects a little bit more of sobering reality into the magnitude of the problem we face. This graph represents the estimated number of acute hepatitis C infections per year. And this number has continued to shoot up in the setting of the opioid and substance use crisis. And our goal of reducing estimated new hep C infections um, by 90% by 2030 is represented in the green dotted line. And we're in fact moving away from this target. But perhaps there's some hope that perhaps we're reaching the plateau with a slowing rate of increase that we observed in 2021. Next slide. <clears throat> so this next slide shows um, an estimate of the number of people treated for hepatitis C from 2014 to 2020 using national pharmacy claims data. And we can see a large number of people being treated in 2014, the first full year of DAAs being available in the market. And this further increases to 2015, um, likely representing a surge in treatment among people who were uh, just waiting for these new novel therapies. However, thereafter, we witnessed a steady decline in the number of people treated each year. And this may be in part because of increasing restrictions that were put in place to uh, prioritize allocation of this treatment to the sickest people but it could also reflect that the people who were the easiest treat, so those that may have access to medical care or few comorbidities, maybe they were treated earlier and that this remaining cohort of untreated people may be increasingly difficult to reach. And then concerningly, but perhaps not surprisingly, we saw a steep decline in 2020, uh, likely reflecting the care disruptions of the early COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, now, if you just saw this in a vacuum, you might wonder whether this reflects maybe a natural uh, decrease in the number of people treated as we reach elimination. After all, the, DA the prices of DAAs have come down substantially and insurers are increasingly removing prior authorization requirements. Next slide. Uh, but this slide shows that despite an increasingly favorable landscape for hepatitis C treatment, there's still significant gaps. So, so this graph uh, shows a laboratory viral clearance cascade, which is our best approximation of the care cascade for the nation. So using Quest data, we can estimate the number of people who are ever infected or those with uh, hepatitis C antibody positive. That's the furthest column on the left. And among that group, we can estimate how many received HCV RNA testing to assess for current infection. And an estimated 88% uh, of uh, HCV antibody positive people have at least one viral test, which while it's not 100%, 88% is not bad. Um, among those tested for infection with hep C RNA, an estimated 69% had evidence of infection. Uh, or at least initial infection. Among those with initial infection, only 34% had the subsequent negative HCV RNA test suggesting viral clearance. Um, now, so people may be treated and cured or naturally clear their viral infection and about 30% of those um, initially infected may spontaneously clear their infection. Um, and it's also possible that people who were treated and cured, uh, but that did not receive sustained virologic response testing at 12 weeks are part of this gap, but it still represents a substantial amount of people that we're not reaching and showing that we're reaching clearance. Um, lastly, among uh, those with documented viral clearance, an additional 6.6% have evidence of a subsequent HCV RNA positive test, which perhaps suggests reinfection. Um, Overall, these data suggest that there are still many people not getting treated despite having diagnosed infection. Next slide. 
So if we hone in a little further on that proportion of HCV infected individuals with viral clearance and compare that across age and insurance type, we see some clear disparities. So people who are younger as represented by the lightest blue column are much less likely to be cured or, or um, have viral clearance across insurance types. And people with Medicaid are also less likely to be cured or cleared than people with commercial insurance or Medicare. Um, not reaching younger populations and people with Medicaid is particular con particularly concerning uh, because people with Medicaid face many more structural barriers to being treated beyond just prior authorization restrictions. And then on the other hand, the younger population, while least likely to suffer from acute complications from hepatitis C, are more likely to transmit hepatitis C and should be a focused population from a treatment as prevention perspective. Next slide. Along with treatment, uh, I'm thinking more along the treatment as prevention vein, hepatitis C treatment is so exciting because it allows you to actively reduce both disease prevalence and the likelihood of transmission in a population with each completed course of DAA therapy. So with that in mind, it would be logical to want to treat as many people as possible as quickly as possible. Um, but this recent analysis um, suggests that only a minority of people get treated within the first year of their diagnosis with hepatitis C. And further, we found that it varied substantially by insurance type. So only 35 of people with commercial insurance were treated within a year of their hep C diagnosis, and that's bad. But this number drops to down to 23% among people with Medicaid, representing missed opportunities to accelerate hep C elimination. Next slide. So all these prior pieces of data come together in this last slide. Uh, this table represents data from NHANES, which we use to estimate national hepatitis C prevalence. It's a household survey that undersamples many of the populations at highest risk for hepatitis C. So we think of it as an underestimate, but nonetheless, the trend over time is really informative. So comparing the 2013 to 2016 NHANES cycle, with the most recent 2017 to 2020 cycle, we found that the number of people with prevalent hepatitis C has largely remained the same. Putting it all together, there's still more people getting infected with hepatitis C than people we are treating and curing. So despite all the progress um, that we've made in terms of increasing access to testing, to treatment and prevention, we're, we're kind of treading water at this point, and we really need to augment our testing and treatment rates in order to get back on the path towards elimination. And um, perhaps one silver lining is that there was a notable increase from 2013 to 2020 in the number of people who were aware of their infection, 56% to 68%. And we hope that this suggests improved rates of testing, uh, perhaps an early signal of progress yet to come. Next slide. So I hope in that first section, I've, I've made a strong case for why we have to do better and bring hepatitis C testing and treatment to the settings where people at the highest risk are. And let's talk about those high impact settings. Next slide. So we've seen a lot of really innovative approaches to bringing hepatitis C testing and treatment to people at risk for hepatitis C in different settings. And we wanted to focus on settings that we knew had ongoing interactions with people at high risk and had the capacity to scale up treatment as a routine part of their care for these populations. And we identified four high priority settings for scaling up hepatitis C testing and treatment. Federally qualified health centers, state departments of corrections, programs that offer medications for opiate use disorder, and syringe service programs. And given how simple hepatitis C testing and treatment has gotten in recent years, we see scaling hepatitis C testing and treatment in these settings as eminently feasible. So uh, worth noting, um, although the focus of this um, convening uh, is on these four settings, it's also worth acknowledging that we're envisioning scaling up hepatitis C care in other settings. And that can include jails, transitional facilities, emergency departments, STI clinics, pharmacies. These are all settings that hold a lot of potential, but then may not have the health service capacity, longitudinal patient relationships, or bandwidth to integrate hepatitis C care in the same way that these four settings can, uh, but nonetheless can pose a lot of opportunity for perhaps test and link. But this is the focus of our uh, current convening. So let's jump into each of these four settings. Next slide. 
So federally qualified health centers um, or community health centers are crucial partners because they offer primary care services to underserved populations. Oftentimes they may be the only care option for people without insurance or people living in rural areas. And FQHCs are able to access funding streams and programs like the 340B drug program to enable them to offer care to patients who are otherwise are uninsured, underinsured, or might have difficulty accessing care. <clears throat> uh, nationally, more than 30 million people receive care at an FQHC each year. And compared to other healthcare systems, FQHCs typically care for a much higher proportion of people who are either uninsured or who have Medicaid. And most pertinent to this convening, of course, is that um, these underserved populations that FQHCs care for are also at higher risk for hepatitis C. So it makes sense to build hepatitis C capacity um, at FQHCs nationally in order to make elimination of hepatitis C among the most vulnerable populations at highest risk possible. Next slide. So to provide you with some numbers, this line graph shows data from HRSA's Uniform Data System, or UDS, which tracks basic information on several health conditions at FQHCs nationwide. The blue line represents the number of unique patients with hepatitis C with, with a hepatitis C diagnostic code um, seen in a given year. The orange line represents the number of tests for hepatitis C done each year. And over time, the numbers of people with a hepatitis C diagnostic code has drifted downward, while the number of hepatitis C tests have increased. And notably, uh, the number of tests done in 2020 was stable from the year prior, despite the pandemic, uh, and then increased substantially in 2021. Um, this likely represents uh, uh, the you know, change from recommendations from CDC and others for the adult one-time universal HCV screening. Um, since hepatitis C is a curable condition, the decline in number of patients seen with a hepatitis C diagnostic code could represent progress in treatment and cures. However, uh, we know from that earlier data I presented that uh, we're still behind in diagnosing and treatment, so I would still interpret this as tens to hundreds of thousands of patients at FQHCs that still need hepatitis C diagnosis and treatment. Next slide. Next, so let's consider prisons. So although many on this call may be themselves correctional health experts, I know several are not. So let me briefly clarify the difference between prisons and jails. So prisons may be federal, state, or private facilities that typically hold people convicted of a crime and serving longer sentences. Um, jails, by contrast, are usually local facilities that hold people pre-trial, pre-sentencing, or for minor offenses. And of, of course, there's always exceptions. And so it, there may be some jails that hold people for multiple years, or even jails that hold people um, under the jurisdiction of the State Department of Corrections, but they're housed at a, um, a local facility due to overcapacity at DOC facilities. It, it's a little complicated, but uh, overall, this population in particular is, is of great interest because um, it's, they're much more likely to have uh, hepatitis C. Some older research estimated that as many as one in three people with hepatitis C may in fact pass through a jail or prison each year. Next slide. So we see state prisons as vital places to make sure hepatitis C testing and treatment is implemented. There were approximately 1.2 million people incarcerated in 2021. And nationally, only a small portion of people in prison are uh, incarcerated at the Federal Bureau of Prisons. The vast majority reside in state prisons. And while we don't have a wealth of data around people with hepatitis C in prisons, an older 2015 landscape analysis by the American Correctional Association indicated that DOCs with universal opt-out HCV screening had an estimated hepatitis C prevalence of 12%. So this is clearly a population we wanna make sure we're reaching with hepatitis C elimination efforts. Uh, my last point is that we should not be thinking of people who are incarcerated as separate from the general population. Uh, around 95% of people who are incarcerated will eventually return back to the community. And so the testing, treatment, and prevention that happens in DOCs are of great importance to us all in controlling hepatitis C in the community. Next slide. 
So let's discuss medications for opiate use disorder or MOUD programs. If you're attending this convening, it should be no surprise to you that HCV infections in younger populations are being driven by injection drug use. In fact, most acute hepatitis C cases with risk data reported, um, two thirds report injection drug use. And that proportion is likely an underestimation given the stigma around drug use. So while we don't yet have great medication assisted treatment options for people with stimulant use disorder, we have a great variety of medications for opiate use disorder. And this includes methadone, buprenorphine, and naloxone. Um, Methadone, which is a longer acting agonist of the opiate receptor, has been around for decades. It's been subject to regulations from the 1970s, which imposed strict limits on the distribution and use of methadone, resulting in opioid treatment programs being separated from most healthcare systems, and until recently requiring in-person directly observed therapy with daily dosing and then routine drug screening to confirm use. Uh, buprenorphine, uh, a newer partial agonist uh, that comes in tablet, sublingual, and long-acting injectable formulations, has not been subject to the same regulations, and so has become increasingly prescribed in primary care or specialized outpatient MAT clinics. Um, <clears throat> in its initial inception, providers were required to obtain a special X waiver from the Drug Enforcement Agency to prescribe buprenorphine, and prescribers were limited to just a few number of people that they could treat. But recognizing that this was a barrier to MOUD treatment, the X waiver requirement was eliminated earlier this year, and all prescribing providers are required to earn some CME on opioid use disorder treatment. So this is a significant step forward and will increase the number of providers prescribing buprenorphine and patients on MOUD who can also benefit from um, hepatitis C screening and treatment. Um, I'll mention briefly that naloxone is an opioid antagonist that blocks the opioid receptor. And it's an option for patients who do not wanna be on opiate, opiate agonist therapy. Um, and it's also associated with reduced mortality, but it's not as commonly prescribed compared to the other two. Next slide. So let's look at some numbers. <clears throat> we know that nationally there are over half a million people who use medications for opiate use disorder. And this graph shows the number of people on each of the three main MOUD agents by year. The majority of people on MOUD use methadone, which is noted in blue, and use climb steadily leading up to 2019. Uh, during this time, buprenorphine, uh, which is noted in orange, has risen faster than methadone to become the second uh, most commonly used MOUD agent. And then lastly, naltrexone, which is noted in gray, remains uh, just a very small fraction of overall, overall MOUD use. So we only have data uh, for this particular data set up to 2020. And there was a notable decrease in the number of people on methadone, uh, likely due to a lot of the disruption from the pandemic. But during this time, there was a lot of significant relaxation of the rules for methadone, and OTPs were uh, allowing patients who were stable to take home doses for use without supervision. They also allowed follow-up with telehealth, too. Um, but even despite these rule changes, there was still a significant decrease in the number of people in, on methadone. But concurrently though, the number of people on buprenorphine continued to increase. So again, this is just uh, to give you a sense of the number of people out there who would really benefit from hepatitis C screening and treatment. Uh, though in scaling up hepatitis C care in each of these settings, we have to make sure that we account between uh, differences in the implementation approach and the regulations across both of these settings. Next slide. And of course, no hepatitis C elimination plan would be complete without emphasizing the importance of syringe service programs, which provide essential services to people who inject drugs or PWID. And we have decades of research showing that SSPs are effective in reducing the transmission of bloodborne infectious diseases. SSPs are venues for PWID to receive low barrier, come as you are care, and they've established trust with the people they serve. So integrated hep C care here would really help us reach the most vulnerable populations that may not otherwise engage in care. So from um, our uh, modeling, we estimate that there are approximately 3.7 million people who inject drugs nationally. Uh, and data from our National HIV Behavioral Surveillance Survey of urban areas indicated that approximately half of PWID reported receiving services from an SSP in the past year. Uh, data from our National Survey of Syringe Service Programs 
indicated that almost half of SSPs themselves reported offering some sort of hepatitis C testing. And we know that the prevalence of hepatitis C is high among people who inject drugs, um, ranging from you know, 15 to 40% or so, uh, depending on the setting. Um, so we absolutely must scale access to hepatitis C testing and treatment at SSPs to reach our elimination targets. Next slide. So this slide shows a map from the North American Syringe Exchange Network, or NASIN. And it's a map of SSPs that submit information to be reported publicly so that they're able, better able to serve their clients. And a number of SSPs have grown, uh, the number of SSPs has grown substantially in recent times with at least 535 SSPs being reported nationally. However, this doesn't convey how challenging it can be to run SSPs, which oftentimes are dependent on a lot of volunteer support. They're often strapped for funding and uh, can be held together just through sheer passion for serving people and saving lives. Uh, further, there's also disparities in where SSPs are located with some states and rural areas having less access or even no access to harm reduction. So when we think about scaling hepatitis C care capacity at SSPs, we have to be mindful of the many challenges they face and ensure that our hepatitis C work improves the sustainability of staff and operations. Next slide. So now let's shift our focus and briefly uh, cover some challenges and opportunities in scaling up hepatitis C care in each of these settings. Next slide. First, it's worth noting that there are multiple barriers to scaling hepatitis C testing and treatment. Uh, this is a list of some barriers that uh, you will probably all be familiar with. Not everyone at risk of hepatitis C knows about it or their status. Uh, those that do face stigma when engaging in the healthcare system. Um, uh, our two-step diagnostic algorithm leads to gaps in complete testing. Uh, the DAAs themselves are expensive and not everyone has insurance coverage with low copays. And insurers may have restrict uh, restrictive prior authorization requirements in place. Uh, further, uh, treatment may not be available where people routinely get care. And lastly, people with hepatitis C may be difficult to reach and face multiple individual and structural challenges to receive care. But of course, we didn't convene our brightest minds in the hep C space to perseverate about barriers, which we all know very well. We wanna highlight models uh, of people actually making it work out in the community in each of these settings. Next slide. On the FQHC front, we have an excellent example uh, from the Cherokee Nation of building up a comprehensive hepatitis C elimination program and integrating it within their healthcare system. This graph is from their MMWR publication earlier this year, and it shows a care cascade with high rates of linkage to care and treatment over the course of 2015 to 2020. Among 1,423 people diagnosed with hepatitis C, 871, or about 61%, initiated treatment. That's great. Um, and these results are even more impressive given that Oklahoma Medicaid had fibrosis and sobriety restrictions up until 2018, and then has um, requirements for specialty provider consults. Uh, the Cherokee Nation is a really great example of showing how hepatitis C care can be integrated with primary care and bring this service to uh, a, a very vulnerable population. Next slide. On the corrections front, we have seen pockets of absolutely stellar performance. Um, and here are some numbers from um, Amy Kravitz from California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation that she presented in a recent seminar. So CDCR launched a comprehensive hepatitis C elimination program in 2017, and since then has treated more than 33,000 people for hepatitis C, reaching a point where they essentially have no backlog of people waiting to be treated. Um, and as you can see, this is reflected in the numbers of them being able to actually cut their hepatitis C prevalence by more than two thirds. This is a huge accomplishment and shows that hepatitis C elimination in corrections is definitely achievable. Next slide. <clears throat> On the MOUD front, this is data from the ANCHOR trial, which integrated MOUD therapy, specifically opioid agonist therapy or OAT, uh, and hepatitis C treatment. The graph shows 
the hepatitis C treatment cure rates uh, by various outcomes of MOUD therapy. So the patients respect, uh, uh, represented in the blue and green bars had come into the trial on MOUD or started MOUD during the trial. And they had uh, SVR12 cure rates of 90 and 92% respectively. So these patients had much higher rates compared uh, to patients that had started and stopped or even never started MOUD treatment. So 63% and 64% respectively. So these results are helpful because they show that you can achieve um, good hepatitis C treatment results um, and even great hepatitis C treatment results when it's integrated in these MOUD settings and you're able to offer both hepatitis C treatment and MOUD therapy. Next slide. So lastly, this slide shows data from uh, co-located hepatitis C care at a large SSP in New York City. So PWID at SSPs are the population that needs the most support to successfully navigate hepatitis C treatment. And for many PWID, the SSP might be their only point of contact for medical services. And many face substantial challenges when it comes to food security, homelessness, or untreated mental health disease. So it's quite remarkable that they're able to treat approximately half of their client population that they knew had hepatitis C, and then also achieve cure rates that were high and similar to that of the general population. So this just, again, shows that hepatitis C integration SSPs can be done. It is not easy, um, but it's a real essential approach from a health equity and elimination standpoint. Next slide. So as we progress through the next two days of panels, I want you to walk away with a feeling of empowerment. You'll hear from a lot of brilliant minds about uh, from around the country, um, how, has, how, how have we made hepatitis C testing and treatment work in each of these four high impact settings? We have the tools we need to eliminate hepatitis C, but now we just need to focus on scaling their implementation in order to reach elimination. So that concludes my introductory presentation. I see we're a little bit ahead of time. So I'll defer to Daniel and Jasmine if we'd like to take a break, uh, pause for questions, or proceed with the subsequent panel. Yeah, I think uh, Jasmine and I would love to do couple of very quick questions before our first panel starts in uh, seven minutes. So, Nate, uh, finally, I got the chance to put you on the spot after spending months planning this meeting with you. Thank you for that fantastic presentation. I want to just pull out uh, one thread that was woven through your slides and remarks, um, and that's health equity. Uh, I think uh, for whether you count back to the World Health Organization uh, push for eliminating viral hepatitis as a public health threat, or the announcement earlier this year from the White House that they were proposing a national hepatitis C elimination plan. One of the questions in my mind, and really that extends to MVHR, NASDAQ, Nature, the HEPNET partners, we've been very focused on not just how do we get to elimination, but how do we achieve an equitable elimination where we're not leaving the most vulnerable people behind? And I just wonder, I appreciated the uh, data from Cherokee Nation. If you have any thoughts about the overlap between these four key settings we're focusing on over the next two days and broader questions of health equity, uh, particularly racial ethnic health equity. Of course, thanks, Daniel. And um, so I, it, I take your point. Uh, you know, uh, you know, it, it's a very good point because uh, inherent within all the data that was presented is, if you look at uh, particularly racial and ethnic groups, uh, there's there's notable disparities, um, particularly among uh, AIAN populations and non-Hispanic Black populations in terms of being able to um, everything. Uh, that entails going across the, the care cascade from getting sufficient numbers of testing to being linked to care, to being able to access treatment and then ultimately find a way to being cured and then um, continuing to remain uninfected. Uh, the HHS plan, which we had um, an opportunity to contribute heavily to also includes 
um, health equity related targets, including reducing the number of new infections for hepatitis C among AIAN population, and then as well as reducing hep C related deaths for non-Hispanic black and AIAN populations. And so I didn't have a chance to present that here because I think I was a little over time, but in fact, it seems that I was under time. And I think it brings a, a really uh, important point of, um, you know, we can make progress in each of these. And as, as we increase the number of people who are tested and treated, we have to also make sure that that is um, reducing disparities as well. So across the board, if you um, just reduced uh, the number of, uh, you know, the, the, the outcomes of uh, new infections and hep C related deaths, uh, there'll still be disparities. Now, granted, everyone will have improvements of their outcomes because, in fact, those constituent groups make up that whole number. And if that whole number is going down, they should be seeing improvements as well. But if we're not careful, we certainly don't want a scenario where um, we have such rapid improvements in uh, groups with more privilege or more access to care at the expense of even stagnation or worsening of outcomes within um, our, our more vulnerable groups. And so as we develop and think about these elimination goals, we kind of have to keep both um, both the relative um, disparities as well as the absolute numbers uh, in our minds. And so as, as we think about planning towards a national hepatitis C elimination initiative and thinking about what's the data that we're gonna be tracking and feeding into that and what data points are going to inform us feeling if we're doing our best to ensure that we're reaching health equity goals. You know, I, I think it, we need to be very self-critical and make sure that we're really going after and, and asking ourselves, are we, are we actually reaching the people who need this the most? Sorry, that was a little bit of a, a long rambly answer. <laughs> yeah, thank you, that's helpful. I appreciate the perspective. Um, I also uh, found myself reflecting during your presentation uh, about a really kind of strong running theme that we see uh, in hepatitis C and viral hepatitis and really overall in healthcare that access to healthcare is uh, not guaranteed and not as simple as we might hope. That we would like to think that since the CDC released its updated hepatitis C testing recommendations that emphasized uh, universal one-time screening for all adults, regardless of risk, along with risk-based screening and screening for each pregnancy, that people will learn their status and then people will take action on that knowledge. Uh, but the settings that you mentioned, really uh, those four high impact settings, do you feel like they have a common denominator of places that people go to when they feel like the other parts of the healthcare system either aren't accessible to them or they've had bad experiences with them or they're not sure how they'll be treated there. Um, is that Was that kind of intentional in highlighting those four settings? Yeah, yeah. I, I think I'll respond by first saying, in general, whenever there's a new recommendation that comes out, it can take years or even decades for it to roll out and be implemented as sort of the standard of care. And you know, we know that these 2020 recommendations are relatively new, but we've we've been encouraged by hearing a lot of healthcare systems and providers recognizing the importance of it and integrating it. But you know, just passively letting something roll out um, is not going to really have it reach the people who need it the most. And so, as you mentioned, like these are very four highly targeted settings, and they may not necessarily be the settings that have the most resources or you know, that um, historically have been uh, very strong in treating, uh, testing and treating hepatitis C. But um, with additional emphasis, focus, support, funding, um, and prioritization, they certainly can be. And so when we think about how do we get everyone following our recommendations for universal uh, adult one-time testing and then interval repeat screening for people at risk, um, it's a very active process of ensuring that we're providing technical assistance that in the setting of a national elimination, we sure that there's funds flowing adequately to these high impact settings to make sure that they're integrating and implementing all these really wonderful hep C policies that we know will lead us to elimination. 
Great. Thank you so much, Nate. Thank you for uh, kicking us off so well with such a great foundation. Um, and I think with that, we will move into our first panel.